Well, 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 well. When your boy Slacky J tells you that a fighter is painfully overrated, and then seven title defences later they get fraud checked, you want to be listening. (laughs) Oh, God, I'm, I'm... It was so hard to decide what to open with today because everyone is hitting me up on Twitter saying, can't wait for the next podcast. I was this close to just doing the whole podcast, not mentioning it, and then being like, oh, I'll talk about it on the boycast. Pay me. (laughs) Um, But, uh, you know, it was was just such a um, fantastic way to lose, fantastic fight. Fantastic performance from Alexa Grasso. I want to, you know, I want to be very clear. She did a lot of things that were a really good idea against Valentina Shevchenko that had someone else done would have worked better than what they than what they did. You know, Jessica Rye, if she had actually tried to get Shevchenko closer to the fence before running at her like a spaz, she'd have done better. So there's lots of cool stuff to talk about within this performance. Big respect to Valentina Shevchenko for almost losing her title off, was it two failed head and arm throws in her last fight? And losing her first fight to Amanda Nunes off a failed head and arm throw? And then coming out in this one and doing a head and arm throw onto the floor with her opponent on her, on her back. She did it at the end of the first round, so she got off largely scot-free, but well done to her. And then it was just her tendency to turn her back all the time that got her caught in the end anyway. Um, But combined with some other stuff, which we'll talk about. Um, Everything else on the card, not even worth talking about because of this, but I am going to talk about it. Um, John Jones really did impress me enormously in the main event. Cyril Garn let me down in the main event. Um, Some very strange... I mean, why would you come out and do like a shifting left straight as your first strike against a guy who, you know, if we were all expecting maybe John Jones has a dumb kickboxing match like he did against many of his opponents at light heavyweight but uh, if you were preparing for the best John Jones you'd have been expecting him to try and take you down at some point so leading with a stepping left straight from Southpaw fucking bizarre but we'll get into that too Uh, we had the meme-tastic fight between Drickus Duplessis and Derek Brunson we had Bo Nickel crush a can by knee to the junk And we had an absolutely monstrous banger between Jeff Neal and um, Shavkat Rachmanov, which I'm going to spend a lot of time waxing lyrical about because it was was an absolute barn burner with technical stuff in it. And that's the the kind of fight you really like. Where two guys are just taking lumps out of each other, but they're doing cool technical shit almost on autopilot. So back to that fraud checking we were talking about. (laughs) Um, Valentina Shevchenko versus Alexa Grasso. It was not top of my list for Valentina Shevchenko opponents. Alexa Grasso, the story on her is well known. She has fun boxing. She's had fun boxing forever, since she fought um, Inoue back in Invicta, when Inoue was hot shit. Problem was, any time someone wrestled her, she ended up losing. Um, and the, the other problem is, like I, someone dug up a tweet from me years ago, actually it might have been just last year, but I said... If Alexa Grasso could knock anyone out ever, she'd be the most marketable woman in the UFC. Because, <laughs> you know, she's got cool boxing, she's good looking, she's Mexican, which is a huge built-in uh, combat sports fan base, and um, she just can't hurt people for love nor money. But the rest has always gave her trouble. She lost that, she lost that close decision to Carla Esparza. She got manhandled by Tatiana Suarez, who's now back, which was uh, a fun thing to have happen the week before this, but sort of went under the radar because <laughs> she wasn't exactly calling out, uh, you know, calling out Tatiana Suarez for the first title fight or, any, or t- uh, title defence or whatever. Um, but yeah, the wrestling has always been her issue. Valentina Shevchenko, while she's touted as this amazing striker, most of what she does is mixing martial arts. Clues in the name, mixed martial arts. That's what she does. Um, she will hang back just on the end of your reach, just too far for you to comfortably hit her with anything except a step-up low kick. And then you throw a shitty step-up low kick, she pulls her leg back and she kicks you, or she pulls her leg back and she spins for a kick that almost always misses, uh, or she pulls her leg back and spins for a back fist that almost always misses, or she steps in, grabs your leg, takes you down. Or she enters a clinch and takes you down. But all of it is off getting you to step in from too far out. And you know, dropping away most of the time, and then stepping in uh, so that you collide at like double speed, 
every third or fourth time. And a lot of her game is getting those clinches, throwing people to the floor. A lot of it's, you know, fucking headlock throws or head and arm throws, which are the bane of my life watching this sport. But, uh, it, you know, if we might have some new people in today because I'm probably going to lead with a, a inflammatory thumbnail or title. And, and, of course, it's also a fairly big thing that happened. You know, the the unthinkably unbeatable champion losing like that. Um, so we're going to have people in who don't know why hidden arm th- throws are so trash. But if you watch any amount of women's MMA, it's full of women grabbing headlocks and uh, either the opponent comes out on their back immediately or they complete the throw and they land in a position on top where the opponent is still just going to turn to their knees and come out on the back. Now, you can convert a head and arm throw into a nice scarf hold, and there are forms of head and arm throw that are are nicer, but uh, grabbing the head in like a schoolyard headlock is what you see tons of in women's MMA, and you don't see it so much in men's MMA because it fucking sucks. And there are people who will go like, well, the bodies are built differently, and the lower center of gravity, and the boobs, and so on. And you're going, no, it's just a shit move. If it doesn't, if it gets people's back taken all the time in women's MMA when they attempt it, and it doesn't in men's MMA because they don't attempt it. It's not because women are better suited to the head and arm throw if it's still going wrong for them. But anyway, let's do the striking because that's where Alexa Grasso did really well in this fight. Um, Valentina Shevchenko, a lot of her game, well, I've, I've already explained it, but she likes to stand way out of distance, just close enough that you feel you can make a swing at her lead leg. If you want to see that in action against a good striker, go watch her fight with um, Joanny and Jacek who really just goes ham after that lead leg because she can't get anything else. And every time she misses, because Shevchenko pulls her leg back, and then either some big takedown or some spinning kick that doesn't do anything, or just a slappy kick to the leg on return. How Roy Jones Jr. used to put his head out there and then pull it back and land counters, she does that with her lead leg. And to do that, she has to constantly correct the distance. You watch a Valentina Shevchenko fight where the opponent doesn't just run at her. They'll move towards her a little bit to try and get more comfortable, get to a more comfortable distance where they can lash out and maybe hit her head or body, and she slides back. And she's constantly checking that distance. Now, that'll work until you introduce the element of a a boundary, the ropes or the fence. No one she's fought has used the boundary well except for Amanda Nunes in spurts in their second fight. Alexa Grasso did very well using the boundary here. Um, If you notice, a lot of this fight... Compare this fight to, like, the Jessica Rye fight. The ring, or sorry, the cage in the Jessica Rye fight looks enormous. And Valentina is just running all around it away from her and easily landing these kicks and counters. Um, in this fight, most of the action, when they're striking, unfolds with Shevchenko's back towards the fence. And from the get-go, Grasso, Grasso is showing feints. She's faking stepping in. What she does a lot, like... Her boxing really is just ones and twos for the most part. From both stances, not normally this much from Southpaw, which very you know got very little mention until Dean Thomas brought it up on the uh, on the broadcast. No one said, "Oh yeah, Alexa Grasso is fighting this entire fight Southpaw until like fourth round." But by fighting Southpaw, obviously she uh, took away the body kick on the open side and head kick on the open side. She put her lead shoulder and back in front of that. Um, she presented the low kick to the power leg, but. Shevchenko wasn't going for it, and she closed the distance a bit more. She put her shoulder and her lead foot a bit closer to Shevchenko. And then through feinting, she was able to get Shevchenko moving back when she didn't need to, and then uh, attacking instead of just waiting. Uh, The first couple of rounds, Grasso is very good at making Shevchenko come to her by faking and feinting at her and then not pursuing her, and then Shevchenko will come back at her and she'll try and counter. But what I really, really liked about this, and you'll see this at its best in the third round, there's a couple of occasions of this, uh, Alexa Grasso getting her to the fence. Because if you're going to just back straight up on a line and look to land cool um, lean back check hooks and counter body kicks and things, you're going to hit a boundary eventually. Or you're going to realise you're going to hit the boundary and you're going to change your behaviour, try and stand your ground or circle out or whatever. And in that third round... Alexa Grasso does a beautiful body jab, head jab, one-two. So four punches in a row, all straight punches, nothing except ones and twos, um, but she gets Shevchenko all the way back to the fence and uh, cracks her with the left hand. Then Shevchenko shoots a bad takedown off the fence, which uh, is probably the first one that Grasso sprawls on and shakes off. 
And then she moves Shevchenko back to the fence again, and she throws a, a two, sorry, a three-two, so a right hook, left straight, and then a one-two on the end of it. And that's the other part. If you've got someone who's going to move back from your attacks, you want to be throwing threes and fours. You don't want to be throwing ones and twos, which is what everyone gets caught doing. I've been saying it forever, but like the double jab is so useful in MMA. We're going to talk about it with Shev, uh, Shevkat Ragmanov leaning back at the waist later, but some of the biggest knockdowns of last year came off double jabs. Uh, Glover Teixeira double jabbed Jiri back and hit him with a right hand. And it was a throwaway double jab, but because it was a double jab, Jiri moved as far as he needed to, stopped to throw back, and, and then was hit by the right hand as he stood his ground. The point of a double jab isn't to hit the guy with both punches. It's not, a, it's not necessary to hit the guy with either of the punches. It's to move him back. It's to chew up space. And when he hits the boundary, you can start throwing bombs. And then when they came out for that fourth round, you saw Valentina Shevchenko was tired, which was important. And then <laughs> the moment you knew it was going badly was when she got back towards the fence right at the start of the round and she did that Superman punch, which was what she was doing over and over again, that was like her only offense against Amanda Nunes in the second fight when Amanda Nunes spent the whole fight trying to put her on the fence. Amanda Nunes never really capitalized on it, but that was part of her game plan in that second fight. And every time Valentina's like, answer was just to try and jump high with a Superman punch and then run up into a low kick to, you know, to score as she was coming off the fence um, because Nunes always gave ground when she showed the Superman punch. But the moment you see that Superman punch, you should know that things ain't going well for old Valentina Shevchenko. She's getting tired. She was walking too close to the fence. And then, you know, if you needed proof she was getting tired and flustered, she threw a back kick from her back to the fence, which is something you don't do. You don't kick generally with your back to the fence. You definitely don't want to be spinning for kicks with your back to the fence. Because the moment the other guy steps up the center, you've got nowhere to go. If you do a spinning kick against someone and they uh, plow into you, and you're out in the open, you can sprint in the opposite direction. You know, you're already in the position that a lot of guys use to uh, get up from. They, they turn their back, give up the back body lock, separate the hands, and then they run out and turn back to face. But if you start with your back foot on the fence, you do a, a spin, and the other guy steps in, you are just pushed face first into the fence with them on your butt. Which is exactly what happened. And Grasso said she'd been training for that opportunity, which I totally believe, because... You know, not specifically that back kick or whatever, but I. so much of Valentina's game is doing, like, not much, not much, not much big spin. And not necessarily getting a big score off the big spin, but certainly looking good and drawing eyes. You know, with the exception of the wheel kick against Ch uh, Caitlin Chikagian, I was about to say Caitlin Kukagian, um, Kat Caitlin Chikagian never really lands that much. I think she back kicked Joanne and Jacek in the boob, but... It does score well with fans and the judges, but it does come like clockwork. And in that fourth round, you see Grasso going forward, not throwing, and she starts orthodox, and uh, she backs Shevchenko towards the fence and tries to duck in on her legs and take her down. Um, so it was clear that she was trying to um, force Shevchenko to the fence rather than just looking to strike in that round. And then uh, she kept walking her to the fence, and Shevchenko tried that back kick and gave her the easy back take. And Joe Rogan lost his mind over the back, uh, the back take. But if you do a bad spinning kick and people expect you to throw spinning kicks, they'll get on your back nine times out of ten, or they'll slide down the side like... Um, if you go watch TJ Dillashaw versus Henan Barrow, one and two. He always knew it was coming because at a certain point, Barrow gets frustrated and throws the back kick as like a, well, what can go wrong? He'd seen him do it against Eddie Wineland and three other people. So he trained to counter it specifically, and he really got a read on him. And then he said he got all his ideas from my articles on the Joe Rogan experience. So good on TJ. Was some cool stuff from Valentina, though. I really liked her jab. Um, certainly in that fourth round where uh, Grasso wasn't striking as much and was trying to sort of really put her face in Shevchenko's face and drive her back to the fence, the jab was working really well for Shevchenko. Um, takedowns aside from the headlock, which I fucking hate, um, she did hit a, a really nice double in the first round. And then if we're going to get into the grappling stuff, um, this was a great card for Empty Half Guard from two people I would never expect it from. Why were we talking about Empty Half Guard the other day? Someone else was doing it. Maybe this is the new meta, Empty Half Guard. But Empty Half Guard is, if you are in the bottom of side control, your opponent has two legs. One is up by your head, one is down by your hips. You throw your near leg, the one that's nearest them, over the back of the leg of theirs that is down by your hips. 
and you hook over the top. And you get this kind of weak connection, but it is sort of talking their knee out. And the way that it works is if they stay there, you can try and feed a butterfly hook in underneath from the other side. You can try and... Um, I've seen guys try and set up for butterfly sweeps and shit from there. But another one that works really well, Luke Stewart reversed Andre Galvao in um, their MMA fight. I mean, you know, I'm always mentioning that MMA fight because Galvao is one of the best grapplers ever. Luke Stewart is just a black belt. And Luke Stewart swept him twice with the uh, the giggler or the knee lever or whatever you want to call it. And then turned him over with an empty half guard escape from the bottom of side control. So if it works on Andre Galvao, it's a weird technique that works on good people. Um, but the other one that I really like from the empty half guard is because it's quite an easy technique to counter, quote unquote counter, you release your, like if the guy has thrown his leg over your leg while you're in, while you're in the top of side control, you turn your hips towards his head and you knee slide. You slide that knee that's caught along the side of their body and it comes out. But when you do that, you turn to face their head. So if you watch um, Rani Yaya versus Enrique Barzola, it, it's one of those great fights because Rani Yaya is gassed as hell. But he's a very experienced black belt. I mean, he's he's been he was in ADCC in like 2005, and he's still fighting professionally. So he's gassed as hell. He's on the bottom of side control, and what he keeps doing is putting the the empty half guard in, throwing that leg over. Barzola will knee slide and turn his hips towards Yaya's head to escape, and as he does so, his weight comes off the chest to chest connection, and Yaya just turns to the turtle away from him, which is much better than being stuck in the bottom of side control. But in this one, and we're going to talk about it with Dricus Duplessis later, but in this one, Alexa Grasso was on the bottom. Uh, Shevchenko was walking her elbows up from, uh, from the top of side control to start stepping over and using the crucifix that she's so famous for. Um, and Alexa Grasso threw the leg over, put both feet inside of Valentina's leg and uh, like lifted her hips up to wedge her, leg, her feet into the floor. Uh, so uh, Valentina was sort of stuck there where she couldn't step over the arm. She was locked in sort of a um, parallel position. Both of them were facing north-south, where in side control, obviously, you want one of you to be facing east-west. But she was there for quite a while, like with her hips up and her leg dra her legs draped over um, Shevchenko's trailing leg. And eventually, I think Shevchenko knee-slided, but I can't remember what she did, but in the course of Shevchenko freeing her leg and trying to move back up to that side control, Grasso used it to begin turning and eventually got to her knees and up to her feet again. I think she walked off the fence as well in that, in that uh, sequence. But that's what I really like about the empty half guard. It's a technique that if they don't do anything, you can start sort of like slowly working your way back to a butterfly guard or something like that. And it sort of prevents them from doing anything worse. They can't mount you with your leg over theirs. They can't go to north-south with, the, with their leg trapped underneath yours. And they're going to have a hard time going to the crucifix if you're trying to like walk around so that you're both facing the same direction. So what guys will do is free their leg, and in the course of that, you could turn to the turtle. And it's just a, a way of making stuff happen, which is what we're always talking about in MMA. The difference between MMA and grappling grappling is that riding time counts in MMA. You know, every, every second you're on the bottom is losing. Um, you're not going to, like, cautiously working your way back to closed guard doesn't help you at all, especially in modern MMA. You know, maybe back in the day, maybe in an unlimited time limit setting, but in MMA, it doesn't help you at all. You want to create movement, you want to get up, or you want to even, like, scramble up on top. So who's the biggest winner from this fight, aside from me? Um, <laughs> probably Erin Blanchfield, uh, if Grasso's wrestling generally stays on course for what it is. Um, biggest loser, obviously, Tyler Santos, because she already almost beat... Shevchenko got fouled out of the win and then uh, lost the rematch because they wanted to book her against someone different. Meanwhile, Shevchenko talked shit the entire time. Um, yeah, but good fight. Good finish. Uh, awesome finish. And now three champions, three Mexican champions of the UFC. How crazy is that? If you count Yaya Rodriguez as a champion, um, which I don't. But <laughs> if you do, that's very exciting. And two, still a lot of champions. Never had two simultaneous British champions in the UFC. If I were the UFC now, I'd be, you know, International Fight Week, I'd just host that in Mexico. I'd do it. I'd do the rematch of this one and Brandon Moreno on the same card. And then I'd do Yari Rodriguez um, versus, I don't know, Volkanovsky at the top of the other. 
But I'm just spitballing. They'll probably do Grasso Shevchenko 2 at the Apex or some shit. So what else was on this card? Very quick main event. John Jones versus Cyril Garnamy, who we spent ages talking about last week. And I was saying, man, if he wins this one, I'm going to have to give him mad props because he's been getting into these terrible kickboxing matches with much worse, uh, less physically skilled, less physically uh, built kickboxers and less technically good kickboxers than Cyril Garn. And he's going to have to try and start wrestling again against a bigger man. And he's been out for four years. And he came out, and the striking was crap. It looked really bad, generally, but he was looking for the takedown. He, he timed a beautiful uh, duck under a punch, and it was made double effective by the fact that Garn stepped with the punch for no reason. Got his clinch, pushed the fence, started working for the back body lock. Garn was uh, freaking out. Jones came around the front, took him down with a double. Garn sits up against the fence. Jones gets on the neck, finishes the uh, guillotine. Very... Uh, popular position to go for guillotines when the opponent's seated along the fence because they don't have much power to move into you. Um, oh, what I really did like in this one actually was he took the, sorry, he got the back body lock on the feet and he did a little mat return and stepped over Garn's ankle, which you'll see a lot in wrestling, but you don't see it so much in BJJ because it makes it quite hard to put the hook in uh, for back mount. So Garn's right foot is caught between Jones's left thigh and calf in the back of his knee, basically. And um, that's something that uh, Ben Askren used to do a lot, and, and Habib. You know, uh, there's a study by BJJ Scout, my boy, um, who he did one on Ben Askren, and Ben Askren used to use this position, and the uh, control the wrist on the other side of the body and just hammer in punches ad infinitum until the guy moved or did something dumb. Um, but Jones here, he, was, he had the tight waist with his left hand. He had Garn's right foot trapped in his left knee, and he was uh, like down on his belly reaching for Garn's far hand, try and pull him over and then Garn posted out to keep the hand away from him and Jones went behind his far knee uh, in what is basically just a half guard sweep you'll see guys do quite a lot um really gorgeous you know it's it's fascinating because that half guard dog fight back control uh fluidity you know they are all completely linked it was just really I mean it was really slick technical work which is what you want to see from a guy who's smaller coming up so jones the great garn shat the bed and now we're like who does jones fight because you know it's i don't want to see 41 year old stipe who hasn't seemed interested in fighting and looked slow in like the two later cormier fights as well uh, let alone the loss to Nganu. i mean i'd love to see jones versus Nganu, but the ufc have burned that bridge badly spivak Spivak? Bruh. So they were talking about the fact that uh, Taito Avasa was the backup for this fight or some shit, you know? Because John Jones is saying, like, uh, before the fight, he's like, Cyril Garn is probably the least rounded heavyweight in the top five. And I'm going, well, I don't think he's super rounded, but Taito Avasa is in the top five, mate. And uh, Sergei Pavlovich, you know, I'm still not convinced that what Overeem did to Sergei Pavlovich couldn't be done by a young, healthy guy who's good at multiple things. Um, Aspinall's an interesting one, but I think he's like lower top 10 at the moment. He's also out for a year because he blew up his own knee. And Curtis Blades, now if you want a bad kickboxing match, that's the one to book. So really the takeaway from this whole card is that there are two divisions we can just close now. You're done with the Valentina showcase division and you're done with heavyweight because it turns out that the best light heavyweight can take four years off and beat the top heavyweight in the company at the moment. So that was an exciting moment, maybe not a great fight. Uh, the Shevchenko one was a, another great moment, okay fight. But there was a phenomenal fight on this card uh, that if you know nothing about fighting, you could still enjoy. It was Shavkat Rachmanov versus uh, Jeff Neal. I, I'll be honest, I didn't expect much out of Jeff Neal. I thought that his uh, win over Vicente Luke was more to do with their styles than it was to do with him uh, recapturing any of the magic that he had when he was coming up. He's a guy who goes back and then throws fast hands when you come in on him. Vicente Luke's a guy who just plods forward trying to hit you slowly. And, uh, you know, they just, the styles played into each other. But, yeah, he, he did phenomenal here. Uh, I thought he gave a real test to a guy that everyone thought was unstoppable. And I thought Ragmanov also, you know, he passed that test uh, in very interesting ways. And it put it came together in one of the most entertaining fights 
you could watch. It was really fun and furious and technical too. But it also highlighted some holes in the Rachmanov game. I put up a little uh, gif on my Twitter of Rachmanov entering these co- these uh, exchanges, and I, I wrote, "This is what people mean when they mean uh, this is what people mean when they say tall man defense," which is something you'll see anal- you'll read analysts saying or hear analysts saying. Um, it's, I mean, we, I think we mentioned it with like Cyril Garn. It's when you're relying on the fact that you're gigantic. <laughs> it's, it's a it's a real uh, phenomenon, you know. It's um, it's your height and reach letting you get away with stuff that you shouldn't. And in this instance, it was Shavkat Rachmanov entering with rear hand uppercuts, which is about the shortest punch you can throw. Doesn't matter if you're gigantic, that's going to bring you into range with the opponent. And then trying to lean back at the waist to stop the opponent returning on them, which was just disastrous. He kept throwing rear hand uppercuts to the body. And I was going, nice. And then uh, leaning back and just getting chinned by... Well, Neil's a southpaw, so Neil's overhand left. I mean, a left hook is what normally kills the uh, aftermath of the right uppercut. But Neil was banging him with overhand right, sorry, overhand left rather, and uh, turning his head around. And then there were other occasions where he'd like he'd punch, and then he'd try and walk backwards, leaning back at the waist, and Neil would follow him because Neil's one of the things that Neil's good at: really bad cutting the ring, really bad changing plan midway through a fight really bad at targeting anything other than the head but he is good at throwing like three or four punch at throwing like three or four punches in rapid succession so there were a lot of occasions where he threw a couple of punches as ragmanov was uh, leaning back and missed and then caught him with a couple more ragmanov was an absolute sucker for the counter right hook in this one which is a pretty short punch to be honest jeff neal throws the right hook as you step in and because ragmanov's hands were always away from his chin and his head was always up in the air. He was getting dinged by those hard. And then you get hit with combinations after that. Um, the man has an iron head, which seems unfair because he's good at everything else as well. <laughs> but uh, man, his defense his defense in this fight sucked. And uh, I think it was Lucas Bourdon, uh, the kickboxing guy. Uh, he, he said, good for Rachmanov, uh, except to, being a, a fun clinch fighter instead of trying to be a jabby, sidekicky, long guy like everyone else in MMA. And I think there is a truth to that. You know, uh, think of Muay Thai. You know, one of the most famous knee fighters ever is Diesel Noy, who was gigantic for his weight. He was like six foot three, fighting guys who were five foot nine. And he just, he went after them. He backed them into corners and he kneed the shit out of them. You don't need to stand back and like push the guy away, semi shield style, so you're never getting close. Can't let you get close. And uh, yeah, Ragmanov's clinch work in this fight was beautiful. Uh, he was stepping and punching the body too and stuff like that. But then you've got to adjust your defense. You've got to make your defense, uh, well, more offensive defense, but also you've got to adjust your defense with the expectation that you're going to be in range a lot. Because where if you're a tall guy and you throw jabs and right straights and then you lean back, you've got a good chance of getting away from most things. But if you're throwing body shots and stepping in with knees and things and then you're leaning back, there's a lot of times that's going to go wrong. And it really did go wrong a lot in this fight. And he showed that he has a fantastic chin, but the thing with chin is that it's it's as, it's as much a physical attribute as it is also awareness. Because the moment you start to get tired, or the moment you don't see something coming, you're going to find punches by, like, dudes who hit half as hard as Jeff Neal will suddenly be hurting you. But all the body punching, the knees to the body, there was actually a really nice um, outside slip to right uppercut. He slipped Jeff Neal's jab or his uh, left straight or something like that to the outside and then came back with the right uppercut to the body. And that was gorgeous. You know, that's something that um, Javante Davis, his whole game is being a southpaw using the left uppercut to the body and the head, slipping and and throwing back the left uppercut as a counter. Um, Or, lesser known one, chap who knocked out Habib Nurmagomedov in training, uh, Zab Judah, amazing counter left uppercut as a southpaw. So... It is a good technique, but again, that's a that's a technique where you have to make your opportunity to get in close and then deal with the opponent's punches from in close, not take your shot and then lean back. But his clinch work looked so good in this. I was just thinking, the the kind of the kind of um, defense you need is not even slipping. It's not even trying to slip punches and, and get down behind your shoulders and stuff. You just need to fight with both hands out front. Put them on your opponent's hands, step in with knees, step in with elbows, folding elbows, um, stepping knees, kicks to the bo- kicks to the legs and body and so on. Um, you know, 
Hand fighting can be used just as well. I mean, it's most famous in Muay Thai, but you, George Foreman and Sandy Sadler used it in boxing, the double hand check. Uh, Daniel Cormier managed to become a, a dangerous boxer in the heavyweight division just by using his double hand check and various eye pokes. And then after you've hit the dude, fall into a, a proper clinch, uh, either like a, a collar tie and, and hit him with some elbows or uh, dig an underhook. And he was doing that. And if he just stuck to that and didn't lean back, he'd be, he'd be golden. Uh, but his knees to the body in this one were fantastic. His his pummeling was gorgeous. Jeff Neal would get the underhook. I put up a clip that was just like some beautiful pummeling. But he, Jeff Neal would get an underhook. Ragmanov would get an overhook and the other wrist, which is you know a position you can start throwing from if you catch the guy by surprise. But uh, what he did instead was he passed the wrist off to his overhooking hand so that one hand was controlling both of his opponent's hands. And then instead of trying to hit him with an elbow or a, or a punch, as John Jones did against Daniel Cormier, you know, controlling two hands with one and then landing a punch, um, he used the crook, he used the bend that was in Neil's elbow because he passed it off to his other hand and pressed it into Neil's belly. He used the bend in the elbow to punch an underhook through and then he was back into an over-under clinch. It was really nice. It's like using the two-on-one to get an, an underhook. Go watch the clip the sequence, whatever, it's it's gorgeous. But he's doing things like that all through the fight. Uh, he was giving up worse controls or better controls to Jeff Neal, posting his head, getting his grips, passing off the controls and getting back to at least the over-under and landing knees and things. He didn't even use like throws for uh, much of this fight. Aside from the, the final sort of sag trip that he stepped around the side of Jeff Neal from that over-under body lock, uh, he stepped around the side, started tripping him, and Jeff Neal in order to balance himself, turned away, freed his arm and let Ragmanov get behind him. Ragmanov grabbed a choke from standing and basically bulldog choked him. But before that even, there was a gorgeous moment where he, Jeff Neal was trying to turn back into him from the back body lock. Ragmanov controlled one of his wrists so that he was like, his arm was across Neal's back and in the crook of Neal's elbow. So Neal's arm was being held back as he turned into this knee. It was gorgeous. Uh, just the, the whole fight, so fun. Neal... Neil took fucking lumps out of him. Um, and this, this lad's been, like, untouchable up till now. I think Neil was let down by the fact that he is such a headhunter. I think, I think you know, the thing is, I think if he'd hit uh, Shevkat in the body as much as, or, you know, half as much as he was going for the head, I think he might have winded him and, and surprised she uh, Ragmanov with a single connection or just slowed him down over the course. Because he got into the third round and it was a late third round finish. Uh, there was, there was. If he'd been building up the attrition on Ragmanov, there's no reason that he couldn't have moved ahead in the third round if he'd been landing uh, significant body shots. Because look at how Ragmanov's body shots were wearing on him. But yeah, um, not. Uh, it was kind of like the Burns Chimaev fight. Not quite. I mean, uh, Burns didn't hurt Chimaev as much as Neil did here. I mean, he didn't visibly rock him or anything like. But. Um, that fight was like back and forward, but there definitely wasn't as much going on. This one, they were really taking lumps out of each other. Uh, but it was kind of like that. You know, it's, okay, this guy isn't just going to run through everyone, but it still was impressive. And I keep saying it, but that fight could be so fun. Ragmanov versus Chimaev. But if they did that now, that'd be like Max Holloway, Conor McGregor won, where it was just, why are you doing this? I love it, but why are you doing it? But also, I love it. Um, you know, you're just killing off one contender for no reason where you could just have them both go for the title one after the other. And then if one of them wins it, the other one can fight the, the first one for the title. Matuj Gamrot versus Jalen Turner was frustrating, like most Matuj Gamrot fights. Um, really only has a one-two on the feet from both stances, doesn't hurt people, and then dives on takedowns. Did use his kicking a little bit more in this fight. I keep saying if he added some element of kicking to his game, he could be more effective. Just a low, low kick, just a calf kick, he'd be doing well. But he added a couple of those to this uh, performance, and it was slightly better. But, um, yeah, largely it was just Jalen Turner countering across the top of his punches. Gamera going for takedowns, and he fails a lot of takedowns. And that's, you know, I think it's because we are taught to value takedown percentages so much. We were talking about this with Jones uh, and his uh, takedown percentage, how it had slipped in recent years. We were talking about this on the broadcast, and I was saying, I don't know if they're all good faith efforts. Because things like the uh, Gustafsson fight, he shot to get the clinch. He didn't shoot necessarily to get the takedown. Um, and if you do like a, a trip attempt on someone and land a use it to land a really good knee, is that a takedown attempt that you failed by getting them to stumble and then kneeing them in the body? Um, yeah, we can't really tell what's good faith in just pure takedown stats. But Matuj Gamrot makes a lot of completely committed efforts at people's legs, 
And he fails a lot, even in fights where he's doing well, because what he does is he, he follows up well. So if you watch him in fights like the Kutata Ladze one and so on, he'll shoot, he'll end up low, he'll do um, what they sometimes call the air guitar, but like a, a limp arm arm drag and start running up to the guy's back from his knees. Um, he, he chain wrestles really well, but he does almost always fail on his first shot. <laughs> he did land a really nice GSP style double leg in the first round of this one, which is um, you know, getting crook of the elbow deep behind the opponent's knee, uh, being bent forward at the waist almost when you're running through the takedown. Uh, which is something you don't typically get taught to do on doubles. If you're shooting a double with your knees to the floor, you want your back straight. You want to keep your, uh, you know, you want to keep a structure as the opponent sprawls on you. But the GSP doubles, the GSP double is like on your, you're standing on your feet and you're bent over the waist. It's a very interesting technique that you don't really see a lot of people doing. So he, he sort of attempted that and he scored it in the first round. I just think I had two rounds for Turner and one round for Gamrot. Um, I it was close enough that I could allow you whatever you want, but it is. Quite odd that Ron McCarthy scored it 30-27 for Gamro. And then the other one that was really worth noting um, was Drickers Duplessis versus Derek Brunson. Uh, just, yeah, both men, chins up in the air, shifting with all their punches, tripping over themselves. <laughs> but uh, Brunson took him down, went to get on his back, and as Dupl- uh, Duplessis was standing up, instead of trying to jump on his back, he threw one arm over the shoulder and then the other one under the leg that was standing up and he got that cradle grip, but Duplessis thought he could still throw him over the top. So he go, he throws him over the top like you would if you were trying to escape someone climbing on your back with one hook or two hooks even. You know, you can just uh, pike up and they'll fall off your back. And instead, Brunson just lets his legs go, swings over the top and rolls through, holding him in the cradle. Really cool move. Um, and then Drickers Duplessis used the empty half guard, which we talked about earlier with Alexa Grasso, uh, which I might write a small thing about because I'm talking about it a lot. But he ended up on the bottom inside control and uh, Brunson had the underhook on the far side, which is pinning him down flat. And Duplessis used the empty half to stop him from doing anything, lifted his hips up really high, kicked his other leg up in the air and used that to pendulum down and push Brunson back into a half guard. And DC and Rogan were like, oh, that's, that's, he's using strength there. But, I mean, applying momentum well is his technique. It was very cool, and I'm going to go and try it. And then Brunson beat the crap out of Duplessis for a little while and got tired, which I feel like has happened before um, in Duplessis' fights. And Duplessis lumped him and uh, beat him up right to the last second of the round, and the ref was going to let him... I mean, I think this was Herb, because Herb was all over the place. Even for Herb, he was all over the place. Uh, the other night, and the corner, I believe, stopped it because he was just taking a pasting. He was clearly out. You don't sit in closed guard, or, you know, you don't sit with the guy between your legs and just let him load up big punches without moving or trying to pull him forward or slip your head. Um, Brunson was done, and the ref wasn't noticing. It was pretty scary. But Duplessis has memed himself into title contention now. Love that man. So bad, but also doing so well. Oh, and the other one that we probably want to hit on is Bo Nickel. Didn't last very long, but really interesting use of the um, the knee tap. Knee tap is if you've got an underhook in a standing clinch and then you reach down with your other hand, get their knee, and you drive their shoulders and centre of gravity over the leg. It's like any other, any trip. You're driving their centre of gravity over the leg that you've trapped, not letting them move it, and then eventually they fall. But the thing with the knee pick is it's kind of directional because you've only got control of one leg. If you just push them backwards, they'll just step back with the other leg, so you've got to sort of push them over the leg you've got trapped. Um, Knee pick, knee tap, both used sort of interchangeably. Really good examples of this in MMA. uh, George St. Pierre did it to Thiago Alves. Um, In grappling, Andre Galvao does it really well. He picks up a single leg, pulls the guy in, and then switches to the knee tap. Uh, Dominic Cruz always had a really good knee tap too, actually. Um, And, you know, general example, just watch Iranians. Any Iranian wrestlers, they love getting the underhook, and they love hitting the knee tap. But it was interesting because Bo Nickel was going for it constantly from the clinch, and then he got Jamie Pickett to the fence and was, uh, rather than trying to lock his hands, he just kept the other hand on the knee and then stepped to the middle and tried to swing him around as... Uh, the Dagestanis do from the body lock, but instead he was running him off the clay, off the cage and into the knee pick. Problem was, he just need him in the groin, and Jamie Pickett's legs came together. And when are your, le- when are your legs ever going to come together when the guy's attacking your legs along the fence? 
unless you've been fouled pretty severely. Um, this was insane. And then afterwards, Bo Nickel was talking like a fucking robot in the interviews. He was like, I'm not a cheater, which is the, like, no one's calling you a cheater. They're saying that a foul happened. It's, it's like uh, when you get something wrong, you know, you make a mistake and then you go, are you calling me a liar? Complete escalation of the situation for no reason. So I think I think Pickett deserves his no contest, to be honest. I, he was always going to, you know, he was always booked to lose. But that's why we have the fucking fights. These people in the replies be like, well, he'd have lost anyway. You're like, well, then why? Why don't we just run the bets through your hypotheticals, mate? Why don't we just have you answer the questions? We won't even bother. We could save all this money on promoting the event and setting up the lights and the sound and stuff. Oh, and he took four minutes to finish an arm triangle, which is kind of a bad look. But that's, I mean, that's really down to him just sitting on top of the guy and squeezing him and not wanting to give him room. Um, Jamie Pickett, not great. I mean, I, I was, it was weird listening to Rogan talk about how great Jamie Pickett is. But I watched his last fight against Tululin, where Rogan was still convinced that Jamie Pickett was really good. He was on a two-fight losing streak. He's fighting Tululin, who was like zero for ten takedowns defended in his previous two. And Jamie Pickett tried to take him down five times and couldn't uh, and got outstruck too. So it was really weird. But um, yeah, Nickel was on top of uh, Pickett in a mount trying to work this arm triangle. Uh, Pickett was up on his side, which sort of is the in-between. You know, when you have the arm triangle grip, you're either trying to flatten them to their back to finish the arm triangle or you're trying to put your chest in behind their arm to turn them up on their side and or keep them on their side and move to their back. And he wasn't really doing that. Um, he was sort of staying with one foot inside. I think he had like a, a three-quarter mount rather than a full mount. He had one foot inside um, Pickett's thighs. Something you're seeing a bit more nowadays. Neil Melanson used to teach it down at the Black Zillions or wherever. And uh, Linton Vassell from Milton Keynes, he finished Liam McGeary in this way by getting the arm triangle. And instead of dismounting from mount to, to uh, next to the guy, uh, you know, side control basically, but holding the... the uh, arm triangle and pointing the same way as the guy. Instead of doing that, you dismount and you put your leg inside their guard. So you have your shin like inside their uh, far thigh and you can push them away from you with that leg to stop them from turning in. And Gilbert Burns did that against Neil Magny in his most recent one. But it looked like Nickel just didn't want to give up any control or try for anything different. So he ended up just trying to finish this submission for four minutes without throwing strikes either. Um, he's clearly got Dana White privilege because they gave him 50 grand for finishing the guy he was supposed to finish and cheating to do it. <laughs> or fouling. He's not a cheat. He's just a fouler. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's that's my opinions on the important fights on this card. There was there's some more. Uh, I've still not watched a couple. Uh, I was watching knockouts, kickboxing events the uh, the other day too. Uh, which had uh, a couple of interesting things on. But we'll be back on Wednesday, Thursday to talk about that on the boycast. We've also got the brilliant Bellator lightweight tournament starting. And a load of other stuff to talk about too. So if you want to get in on the extra stuff, get the boycast every week. If you if you think I'm too negative on this podcast, tune into the boycast because it's a thousand times more positive. I'm talking about all the great fights that are happening at the weekend, not just in the UFC, not just in Bellator, in weird places out there. You know, we were talking about Subriel Matias versus Jeremias Ponce last time. And then people came to me on, on the Monday and said, Slacky, that was a banger happening in the backyard somewhere that made it onto YouTube. So if you want to get in on all that, Sign up to the Patreon, become a boy, support the podcast. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jacksnakepodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. No disrespect, Valentina Shevchenko is top 200 all time. Bless.